Welcome to another episode of Domains 21. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Lee scaller Pissette and Susanna McGowan from Georgetown University. Welcome to you both to Domains 21. Thanks so much. Thank you, glad Hi. to be here. Thanks for joining us. So we're gonna talk a little bit today and uh, I'm gonna use one of my handy dandy bumpers because that's how I do it about taking care, effective labor in digital learning. And so Lee, I know that you wrote an article um, for the Educause Review. I think it was back like in the height of things, March, 2020, was it the 26th or thereabouts? And so you published this in the, in the midst of basic, you know, uh, panic across uh, global higher ed, but in particular US higher ed. And so what are we talking about when we're talking about affective labor? Is there any way we can start with the definition of that and move from there? Sure. Yeah, so this comes from uh, the idea of affective or emotional labor. I tend to use them interchangeably. Um, we can get into a semantic debate around it <laughs> at another time. But uh, it comes from Arlie Hearthchild's um, book, uh, A Managed Heart. She's a sociologist, and she was really interested in the kinds of invisible labor that service workers do. And so she primarily studied flight attendants. And how she defined affective labor is the, is the work that needs to be done to manage your own emotions, there's the managed heart, in order to instill the proper emotions from the person that you're working with. And I know that we don't like to, you know, especially in academia, we don't like talking about our role and, and putting it on the same level as people who labor or, you know, the service professions, right? We're above all of that. But at the end of the day, we're all workers, right? We all labor. And um, we do perform levels of affective and emotional labor um, in terms of our interactions with students, in terms of our interactions with, other, with faculty, with our own colleagues, with administrators, um, in terms of just being able to, again, manage our own emotions and emotional reactions in order to ensure the, um, in order to not ensure, but to encourage the proper emotional reaction or the desired emotional reaction from um, the person or people that you're engaging or interacting with. Susanna, do you want to add something to that? I would just add that I think it's what you mentioned as the management of emotions is really what propelled us into thinking about how this all played out during the pandemic. And I was fortunate enough to start our summer working with Lee, co-facilitating a particular uh, faculty development workshop that we were providing as part of our center. And that's where we started uh, chatting and talking about how the management of our emotions um, were really coming into play and in terms of our work and how we, and our center's response to the pandemic. Yeah. And so it, it's just, it's been an interesting, oops, sorry, go to, I, said, I was going to say, it's been a really interesting journey um, in terms of, um, again, from writing that first piece in March to uh, Suzanne and I actually co-authored a piece that came out recently in a you know peer-reviewed journal. It's in the uh, Journal on Centers for Teaching and Learning um, on um, this very topic and just how mm -hmm. revelatory in a lot of cases, it has been for people because we have managed to give language to something uh, that people have been struggling to try to describe. Why the work we've been doing during COVID-19 and the pandemic in particular, but also even prior to that, why it's been so hard, right? Why is my job, why am I so exhausted at the end of the day? What is it that is making my job particularly hard? Um, and so to be able to give language to it, I think has been really a wonderful experience where people have an understanding and say, oh, that's what this is. That's what the kind of work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to have conversations around it, I think has been really a meaningful um, uh, outcome from all of this, uh, for me in any case. Even just our our, mm -hmm. our conversations, Susanna, as you were saying, exactly. like we were able to we were able to have these meaningful conversations mm -hmm. um, when the work got tough, right? When the work mm -hmm. got really tough, we had language to to be able to articulate it, and then to be able to to 
maybe mitigate isn't the right word, but to to work through it in a in a productive way, as opposed to it just being there and stuck in it. Mm -hmm. it it's interesting too because one of the the community we're talking with right now and two is predominantly instructional technologists, learning designers um, in the academic fields. And I think one of the things you both were talking about was this moment of becoming essential services on campus and thinking through what that means. I mean, I'd be interested in hearing like, what does it mean and how does that change the relationship between say mm -hmm. folks who work as what are often called um, admin faculty versus faculty and some of the dynamics there, because I was really taken being an admin faculty and working as an instructional technologist at Mary Washington for over a decade. I was really struck by the way you were both able to articulate some of those tensions that exist. And I know a bunch of people listening to this right now can relate as well. So what does it mean to be essential? And like, how do some of these dynamics play out in your own work? Suzanne, you want to take this sure. one first? Yeah. So that's exactly right. We we talk about the what it meant to all of a sudden become essential in the work of instructional design and educational development, faculty development, where um, as Deandra Little and David Green have talked about educational development being in the margins of any sort of educational ecosystem, and all of a sudden we're in the center and the way that we're we were our center was being described by the university was that we were essential, but we were also shouldering the development of, or planning of uh, helping faculty create and design their whole digital environments for the fall semester, fall of 2020. Um, so it, that, was, that was a big shift in terms of our work with faculty and then also, again, going back to this concept of management of emotions, then working with faculty in our community, um, departmental admins, some graduate students and students, really thinking about what the emotions were, were mirrored in our interactions with everybody within our institutional community. And then how, how are we going to, and we were all mirroring this sense of uncertainty. We didn't have all of the answers to all of the questions, but we were using our knowledge and expertise to bring what we did know or what we do know to how to address some solutions and possibilities for teaching and learning. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the one of the keystones um, of teaching and learning centers, but even academic technology centers, academic technologists, and and just a um, you know, the underlying um, ethos of higher education for any of this support is that faculty do not have to avail themselves of it, right? And so we are built for faculty who want to come to us to work with us. The faculty who want to come and talk about pedagogy, the faculty who want to come and talk about um, the pedagogical value of uh, incorporating new digital tools. But all of a sudden now, we are engaging with faculty who have never come to the center before and who have never had any interest in it. And it's not like that we were being, it's not that the administration was forcing them, but they felt forced by the circumstances to come and get this training that they, you know, they knew they needed, but didn't necessarily want, um, you know, and, and to engage in some pretty, you know, again, this is where the, the, the management and the emotional management comes in is that we're talking about a sort of being twice vulnerable for these faculty. So not only you're talking about something as um, personal as their pedagogy and, 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 asking them, nudging them, encouraging them, hoping that they'll, you know, take some self-reflection and self-examination on their pedagogy. But on top of that, you add a layer of um, anxiety over the technology itself, right? I don't know how to use the technology. What if the technology goes wrong? Um, you know, that's, I don't understand how this even works, right? Let alone how to integrate it into my pedagogy. I just don't understand how it works. And so you're dealing with faculty who are really vulnerable, not just because of the pandemic and the uncertainty, but because of what we are asking them to do and requiring them to do, um, which is something that they're really not used to doing. 
um, in, in a lot of cases, right? We have, you, you have the people who are there and ready and able because they've done this kind of work before. But then, you know, the majority of the people we saw over, over the summer in particular were people we had never seen before, mm -hmm. right? Never mm -hmm. engaged with us, probably have never taken a, a, a critical look at their own pedagogy, never thought of incorporating technology in any way, shape or form beyond perhaps being able to pull their PowerPoint slide up into the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And now we're asking them, we'd like you to engage in active learning and also learn how to use Zoom and maybe rethink all of your assessments and, 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 and. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a really, you know, not only were we becoming essential, but essential in doing kinds of work with faculty who were not used to doing that kind of work and sometimes uh, you know, actively resistant in some cases. And so to, to be able to, again, manage our own emotions, to be able to sort of be like, okay, so yes, that is one way to teach the class online um, <laughs> or in a remote setting. Um, maybe we can explore some other ones. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, and they, they all come in with different expectations, with different you know levels of experience. And so all of that was a much more complicated process than even our usual day-to-day -day interactions with faculty in the before times when people came because they wanted to, as opposed to feeling that they had to if they wanted to, to survive the fall semester. And I, and I would just add to that, that Lee and I are very familiar with resistance in, in this work and we're, and we can anticipate it to some extent. Um, and we're, and we're able to provide responses to faculty, often evidence-based responses about approaches, you know, the active learning literature, that's really just, um, blown up in the last 10 years that we were drawing on lots of different frameworks and um, evidence-based practices that we're sharing with faculty in a very condensed time frame. But the the resistance that we were seeing was extremely concentrated. So what we're so what we're talking about really is a course design workshop. It was a three-day workshop that we did every week last summer. So from May, so like I said, Lee and I did the first week that we offered this particular type of development, we started together in May. And then I think I did my last one the third week in August. So it was it was continuous, it was relentless, it was really thinking about, um, it was exciting, you know, it was, you know, this, it, I'm reading, um, you know, A Paradise Built in Hell right now by Rebecca Solnit, and it definitely resonates with what we were going through last summer in terms of developing this community to respond to what felt like a disaster and we're responding in emergency situations, um, but it was highly concentrated. And I, just, I, I think some of the resistance wasn't just, I don't really feel like changing my teaching practice this semester. It was more, I don't feel like changing my pedagogy, how I use technology, um, talking to my departmental colleagues in this way, again, going back to the vulnerability of being seen and, and visible within a Zoom frame and talking about what you do or do not know. So, so it was very concentrated um, forms of emotions that we were um, interacting with on a, on a daily, weekly basis. One of the things you bring up is both the need, which becomes very clear with the moment of the pandemic, but you also talk a bit about the cost. And I'd be interested just maybe to flesh out a little bit like when we're talking about the cost of this effective labor, not only for the folks who are supporting faculty, but for the faculty in relationship to that, um, what has the cost been? Let's, or is it a better word, the toll? I don't know, <laughs> you let me know. <laughs> Well, I think there's two sides of it. There is a cost and there is a toll, right? Um, the toll is per highly personal, right? And everybody dealt with the toll in their own ways. Um, I'm an extrovert. Um, and so it was a very different toll on me than some of my introverted colleagues, let's say that I've, that I've spoken with. Um, it was exhausting, right? It was physically like I would get be physically tired even though I am sitting in exactly the same spot I was sitting in when I was doing all of these, um, all of these consultations, all of these workshops, all of these, all of this programming, I would, I would be physically tired at the end of the day. I would, you know, and, 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 and mentally and emotionally exhausted. 
um, which takes a toll when you also you're at home and you're also with your family who are also dealing with a pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a toll to be taken on everyone when I, you know, I, you know, I'm home and I leave the room and the kids are there and they're like, mom. And I'm like, don't, right. There's no transition. It used to be, I could drive home or take public transit home and you'd have 20, 30, 40 minutes, as much as we might lament the commute. It was time to, to shift gears. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and to sort of let the day go gradually, as opposed to just like opening the door and and every and life is is there. Um, and so, and that's that's not uncommon. Of course, that's something that we've all had to deal with working from home, and our faculty have had to deal with that exact same thing. But it's um, the you know the toll was there. I I insisted that uh, we take a vacation to go to a beach. Um, socially distance and 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 all of that, but like I, at a certain point, I was like, I just need to get out of our house because um, I can't and and not talk about faculty development and not talk about education <laughs> technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> I think absolutely the toll uh, in terms of working at home. We've 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 read a lot about this in the last years has been, especially for those of us who ha have children at home, um, Lee has two children, I have two children at home, and and working with their, their um, issues and emotions as well. And, you know, some, I think it's funny now that we meet for lunch in the kitchen and talk about how our Zoom meetings went and we're checking in with each other continuously around that. So I think there's a, there's a toll on that the blurred boundaries of work and and home life and um, self care and it, that that's been well documented in the past year and I and I appreciate everybody that writes about this and tweets about this. I think the cost um, in the workplace has been sort of this. I would say. Uh, continuation of thinking about what are some of the new ways that we can support faculty. Um, how do we evolve the type of support that we're providing? And I, I think there's a cost in that in the sense of thinking of weighing whether we continue supporting faculty as we have been doing and having conversations and just being there. We're very visible, we're very present, and we're transparent. But to what extent do we need to keep thinking of new ways to provide support? Um, so, Lee, you, 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 does that make sense to you? What I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's about. Of, we don't. I don't feel like we need to innovate right now. I think we need to continue and to sustain uh, the type of support that we're providing, and that we've been really effective at in the last year, and sustaining that ethos and taking care of each other, um, so that the toll doesn't increase on us. But also, let's keep doing what we're doing because it's working well, and we've we're now essential, and I think we are visible. But, but Lee, I'd love to hear what you think about that concept. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it's like, it, it's, a, it's a double edged sword, right? The bar has been raised. Um, we are now way more visible. But, but the, the thing that I find interesting is like, the type of visibility that we have is that, um, that there is still this, that, which is why I want to have these conversations. I want to write about these things, because I think that the, our visibility has been uh, has been um, raised. We appear competent. We appear ready. We prepare appear prepared. We appear prepared. There we go. Um, and and that and it 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 really we don't want to talk about the challenges and the tolls it has taken because we have to maintain this appearance of um, readiness, right? And so I think that that there's a there's a bit of a of a cost there um, of you know now that we have done so well um, we can't fall apart now right we can't show any cracks or the and and that hasn't been our, that hasn't been articulated or clearly stated but there is this sense that um, th there's there's not a space yet not a good space yet for having more in depth of these conversations to be able to uh, reflect on what has happened, on the toll it has taken on us, um, on the impact it's it's having on our center, on our individuals, on our programming, on our institution. And then, like you said, um, you know, and just sit with that for a little while rather than like barreling forward. 
um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the, it's, we, you know, the cost has been time in a lot of cases, right? The cost has been time. There's no time and there's no space. Um, and you know, those are, those are the, the kinds of things that are, I think are needed right now, um, to, to replenish so that we can continue doing this work. And we can um, continue being uh, effective at at what we're doing. Um, so I think that the that's that's been the 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 personal toll and the the kind of cost on on us collectively. And and also to note that it is disproportionately, you know, when when we talk about toll, it, it disproportionately has fallen on women. The research has shown that too. That we're doing more work at home. We're doing the emotional labor at home as well as at work. Um, we are doing the, the, all of that heavy lifting. And so there's, there's an acknowledgement even of that, of the unequal um, nature of uh, the, the toll and the work that we are, that we have been asked to do both professionally and personally, um, you know, all of those things taken together. And I'm struck in particular by the idea, Susanna, of like, staying within it, like not, as you were saying, Lee, like barreling forward to the next thing now that it's, you know, maybe letting up a little bit, let's, you know, go back to what we were or move forward to something totally different. And it's interesting because one of the things that I think strikes me about the work you're doing, which is super important, is at what point do we know and can we, measure is the wrong word, but can we get a sense of like, how that sent recognizing the essential nature of this work, elevating some of the people who were doing it, right? Really finding a way to value within the institution more broadly that time spent and that work done. And I think obviously I want to barrel forward, so I'm I'm part of the problem. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back and say like <laughs> like without barreling forward, how does some of that recognition, you know, get not only established but then celebrated? before we start saying, here's the next step, take this on now, right? Here's your next duty, should you choose to take it. So uh, <laughs> should we choose to take it? I'm not sure there's much choice there. Let's, let's be honest, right? That's yeah. the... <laughs> I think that, so it's, it's important to know that at this point in time, we're still operating uh, without knowing what the fall semester entails. So we are, are still in this uncertainty zone of waiting and and seeing what's what's ahead for us but in terms of recognition uh, we've we're a very established center we uh, candles the Center for new designs and learning and scholarship has been around since 2000 so we're celebrating our 20th anniversary within a pandemic year so we're fortunate to have lots of tentacles in different committees and different partnerships have cropped up. Um, especially this one weekly meeting that happens um, with faculty where we are now seen as partners in discussing instructional continuity. And we often have a rotating set of colleagues who are there at that, at that meeting to answer questions, field questions from faculty. We're all, now we all go to wait for the announcement of what's happening over the fall. So, um, so there are pockets of recognition happening Definitely, the more that we're able to be a part, if there if there are opportunities to be a part of the infrastructure of our university, then there are opportunities for us to then think about how we can have more distributed forms of support going going forward, and having that yeah. recognized as as essential to conversations, especially as we're trying to work through what's happening for the fall. Yeah, and I think that that goes generally for higher education, right? It's very siloed. You know, edu uh, higher education is extraordinarily siloed. Um, even our own center of new designs for learning and scholarship candles. Um, I always have to think about it. Um, is, is we are unique in so far, yes, we've been around for 20 years. And even then we were ahead of the curve in so far as we are a traditional teaching and learning center, uh, an academic technology uh, unit and the e-learning and online learning unit. So we have instructional designers and education technologists and faculty developers all working together in one center. That's actually not that common. Mm -hmm. um, at universities. And so, um, you know, already, uh, we're fairly fortunate in terms of, uh, of the infrastructure of the institution. We're, we're an integrated center yet still like a, like a traditional teaching and learning center on the margins or academic technology unit on the margins. And I think that this goes for 
any any unit now that is supporting faculty and and or students the the pandemic has revealed that we need to be having cross unit conversations about supporting students educating students um, um helping students be successful Mm -hmm. um, our colleagues in student services are also now essential workers and are doing heroic, even more heroic work than they usually do in making sure that our students are okay, even though they're all over the world um, and in so many different circumstances and still tr working really hard to try and build community for the students, a sense of belonging for the students that they're not able to get because we have been entirely remote for the um, 2021 academic year. So you know, more integrated overall, like how do we integrate staff into these larger conversations around student success? Um, where it's not, so where it's happening and you're getting a multiplicity of voices on what our students need to succeed. And I think that the, the pandemic has really revealed um, once you take away this, the, the, the so-called so safety net of campus, uh, particularly for residential campuses. I know this doesn't really apply as much to community colleges or you know um, non-residential institutions, but certainly for primarily residential institutions, um, the, the faculty in particular have had their eyes open to just how much support the students have are receiving on campus and how much that matters to their success in the faculty's classroom and in the faculty's class. Well, that's pretty, I mean, I have to say, thank you both, not only for coming here and talking about that, but I just want to acknowledge your effective labor here at the Maine's 21 session. And the fact that you're keeping the conversation around this discussion is that, you know, when I did read the articles, the thing that struck me is that these are conversations that are very hard to have in the institution because the institution, like you said, is set up in certain ways, whether you're not working alongside the same people and candles is a particular group and i think i saw eddie maloney talk about blogs back in 2004 as part of yeah. candles i mean mm -hmm. it really was a kind of a, a unique space and mm -hmm. a lot of folks didn't have that infrastructure to work from mm -hmm. and watching the work you do and then saying even we need to slow down we need to think about what works and, you know, stop pretending that this is a year for innovation and, you know, taking giant risks. It's a year for healing and figuring out what comes next in some, you know, holistic way. So I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think that you're right. These are really hard conversations to have in higher education. We still like to think for some reason that we are rational in higher education, right? We are knowledge workers. Um, yeah. And so even to say the word, I think I, I joke that we like, what's the difference between emotional and effective labor? And I said, well, they had to make up a word. They had to come up with affective labor because nobody in higher education wants to talk about emotions. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, except our colleagues in student services where they're all about like the, the well, socio, well, socio well being of the students. But elsewhere. Right. People don't like to talk about emotions. We don't like to talk about, you know, we're, we are we are of the knowledge. We are thinkers. We are not feelers. Right. Yeah. And so to, to, to really be able to engage in these conversations, there's there's a gendered nature to it as well. Right. Where there's a danger of talking about it. Um, not, not a danger, but a risk. There is a risk of talking about it as as, mm -hmm. as being dismissed as a, that's a gender thing or a racialized yeah. thing. Um but but again, you know, unless we we keep talking about it, and I'm, uh, you know, I'll keep talking because which you're I doing, do. which uh, is good. <laughs> yeah, but but it's pushing the conversation forward and giving it legitimacy, right? Yeah. And and working to legitimize it as something that is an important component. It helps us do our work well. It's not always a bad thing, but you still have to, you, you, you have to recognize it. You have to be able to have a conversation about it. You have to be able to um, have opportunities to get better at it. It's not something that we're all sort of innately born with that we're like, I'm really good at, you know, consultations. It's like, no, I've taken a lot of, it's, it's taken some time and a lot of practice and most of us have figured it out on our own. Um, yeah. And so how can we start, you know, moving past just recognizing it and saying, all right, how do we nurture it? How do we grow it? How do we grow this capacity that we now recognize as being so important to um, us being effective at our jobs? 
um, yeah. and and with the with the you know with the the ultimate goal of improving student success, right? And that ultimately is everyone's goal, hopefully mm -hmm. within an institution. Mm -hmm. um, but, <laughs> but that you know, if we can recognize this element and say it, it's not just you know these bulleted points of very specific um, technical skills or or um, you know technical knowledge that you have, but also this the socio emotional skills, right? Soft yeah. skills. Um, but let's call let's call it what it is. It's still work. It's a called. It's it has a yeah. name. It's affective labor, and we can, um, you know, we can develop it. And so let's think about ways that we want to be able to do that. And then again, recognize it, reward it, um, encourage it, and and help it thrive and 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 flourish in that way. Rock not rock. <laughs> 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 Thank you both again for joining us. And yeah. uh, we look forward to more. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank this you was, so much for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. <laughs> oh, nom nom.